Hi, welcome to clip four of this week's uh, lecture on structuralism and Levi-Strauss. Um, again, those of you who reached the end of the previous clip will have noticed a pretty abrupt ending to it. I'm struggling. Uh, I'll probably make the same mistake in this clip. Apologies in advance. I'm struggling with that last button that I have to press. Uh, but I don't think it matters so much to just know that you didn't miss anything. <laughs> I didn't say anything more than what was on the recorded on the previous clip. So in this clip, I ju just really want to exemplify uh, a little bit some of these ideas. Uh, one with reference to Levi-Strauss's work himself and another with reference to Mary Douglas, who actually is hardly a structuralist or was hardly a structuralist. But the famous argument that she makes about pollution uh, in her analysis of the kosher laws in the Leviticus uh, actually can be used as a nice example of what a, a structuralist argument looks like. A third example that I don't need to give you because I've already done so would be Pierre Bourdieu's analysis of the Kabila house, which I mentioned last week in relation to Marxism. And you'll remember there the way in which he analyzes the kind of material culture of the kind of uh, Berber house in North Africa in terms of these structural oppositions. Uh, and that's very much this under, kind of reference to the underlying code that the Berber house in its uh, visual manifestation uh, uh, exemplifies, right? So that's a good example of structuralist analysis as well. And Pierre Bourdieu was deeply influenced by Levi-Strauss as well as critical of him. But with regard to Levi-Strauss, I really want to um, uh, draw uh, your attention in this clip just to the central idea of that book that I've asked you all to read in its entirety for this week. I thought you should read at least one whole book as part of this course. I chose a very thin one, but I did choose one by Levi-Strauss, which kind of shows uh, my own proclivities uh, towards structuralism, but I force you to read it. Uh, Totemism is a book, an example of a fairly early stage of Levi-Strauss's thinking. Um, those four volumes on the study of uh, uh, Amerindian mythology that I mentioned come uh, rather later, in the later 60s and 70s. Uh, but in Totemism, we see a great example of this idea of what it looks like to do an analysis that is structuralist by kind of investigating the underlying code-like relational structures rather than staying at the surface phenomena, right? And basically he's looking at phenomena of totemism. Totemism was a big anthropological riddle from the 19th century already. Anthropologists are asking why do certain groups identify themselves with certain totemic animals, plants, or other natural features, right? And why do they organize, for example, the way that they relate to each other according to these identifications, the way that they eat, the pro prohibitions of eating their own totemic animals, or particular food-related practices, and a whole configuration of social and cultural kind of practices and ideas um, is formed around uh, these totemic identifications. And he basically um, um, argues that earlier anthropologists really were um, uh, pursuing a red herring. <laughs> a red herring might be a totemic animal in its own right, I don't know. Uh, but we're kind of going up the wrong avenue of exploration in trying to think how what characteristics about any particular given group explain the fact that that particular group uh, identifies with a particular animal or plant. So is there something about a particular group that makes them identify with turtles as opposed to eagles would be a question that um, anthropologists would be asking uh, before Levi-Strauss. And they might be, if they were Malinowski, I, 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 um, advancing a kind of utilitarian explanation, something to do with um, the scarcity of food or something like that, or the need to protect particular animals from overhunting, those kind of utilitarian functionalist accounts. Or on the other hand, you might have Durkheim's more sociological uh, uh, accounts, which has something to do with the totem, as we saw, um, manifesting the social group's power in its entirety and objectifying it as a divine force. Remember that idea from Durkheim uh, on the power of ritual as the origin of uh, the, the, the power of the social fact and of society itself. Levi-Strauss keeps an equal distance with regard to both of these approaches to totemism and says that they got the wrong end of the stick because what makes um, uh, tot totemic animals so interesting and powerful as sources of identification and thought 
for people in different parts of the world is the fact that the structural relationships between those animals and plants furnish a template with reference to which human beings can organize their own relationships and the differences that their own relationships require with regard, for example, to the way that they organize themselves into different clans or into different corporate entities, different lineages, different territorial groupings, right? So what you have for Levi-Strauss is basically nature acting as the palette of distinctions, providing the code through which humans can express the differences between themselves, the social differences between social groupings, right? So totemism is a little bit like language, right? Uh, the, dis the difference between turtles and eagles and crows and bats and tree creepers and all of those animals that you'll encounter in this weird and wonderful tour of totemic phenomena that uh, Levi-Strauss takes us on in his book, Totemism, are really just uh, sophisticated languages that allow human beings to talk about the oppositions between social groups. So there's no point looking at why my group identifies with an eagle and your group identifies with a crow. Rather, we should ask ourselves, well, what is it about the difference between an eagle and a crow that is being used here to reflect the differences between your group and my group? Or my group and your group, to keep the, the analogy proper, right? So basically, we're using the language of different kinds of birds and the particular differences that we might know hold for those birds, how high they fly, what kinds of food they eat and so on, in order to express the, dif the differences metaphorically that we consider important between my group and your group, right? So that's a kind of example of structuralism in action, using basically totemism as a kind of um, code-like phenomenon uh, of structural organized patterns of relationships that are being deployed and underpin the social phenomenon of totemic identification that anthropologists have been talking about for ages, right? Read the book and uh, you'll deepen this thought a great deal. The second example I wanted to mention is Dame Mary Douglas, uh, UCL. Uh, I was going to say born and bred, but that's not true. Uh, she was trained actually in Oxford by Evans Pritchard, uh, but was the kind of uh, reigning intellectual force in the UCL Department of Anthropology for a number of decades before she moved to the United States. Actually, in the latter part of her career, at the very end, the last few years of her life in the 2000s, she moved back to London. And we were actually very privileged to have her back in the department talking to us and to our students uh, very much until um, uh, the time when she was um, given this honour by the British government, <laughs> which I imagine she was very proud of. Her, her husband was the chairman of the Tory party, would you believe it? Very unusual for an anthropologist to be involved in conservative politics. But Mary Douglas was uh, at least, uh, you know, I don't know what her politics was like in the end of her life, but certainly in her height of her power, she was identified in that particular way. Uh, anyway, a really uh, inspiring, towering figure in her work, uh, if not in other ways, with regard to what I just said in terms of the, the politics. Um, so a very famous book of hers from 1966 is called Purity and Danger, which is really a profound anthropological study um, of the Old Testament and particularly the kind of food prohibitions very much related to totemism. And that's why I chose this as an example, the kind of prohibitions on particular kinds of foods that the Leviticus uh, prescribes. Um, so the idea that certain foods are uh, to be deemed not to be eaten, that they're somehow um, to be treated as taboo or polluting even, right? And a classic example, of course, would be pork, both in Islam and in Judaism, of course, you can't eat pork. And there's been a lot of debate. I think I mentioned last week the kind of cultural ecological idea or of the kind of material materialist approach that would say that, oh, if we want to explain why people don't eat pork in a particular part of the world, maybe we should look at questions of nutrition of food hygiene, of something that maybe there's a physical little material explanation for it. 
Mary Douglas will have none of that. She says, actually, the explanation is structural. And she goes through the taboo uh, food prohibitions in the Leviticus and shows how uh, animals that are prohibited from being eaten are deemed to be polluted because they are somehow ambiguous with respect to the categories uh, with reference to which these eating prohibitions have been formulated. So, for example, in the Leviticus, you are meant uh, to uh, only eat food that both chew the cud, uh, such as the cow that you see there, and have a cloven hoof, right? So the pig is ambiguous with regard, with regard to that rule because it does have a cloven hoof, but it doesn't chew the cow, cow, a cud, it doesn't ruminate its food, right? So the ambiguity of pork makes it uh, uh, the fact that it falls betwixt and between categories in that kind of red zone of danger that I put on this grid-like diagram that I made for this, that makes it um, kind of unusual, interstitial, and therefore uh, with the power to have a polluting effect. The famous expression that uh, Mary Douglas actually borrowed from the American pragmatist philosopher William James was that uh, polluted or things that we de deem to be dirty are actually just matter out of place. They're things that fall between and betwixt or cross abominably across categories. To give, so to give you a less kind of complex and uh, you know, involved example, if I, as I often do in the morning, spill some of my favorite Greek Attiki honey on my jumper, which happens to me quite often because the runny honey that I like is precisely runny and difficult to control, something that I deemed to be perfectly clean and was about to put in my mouth suddenly becomes dirt because it's out of place. Honey should be on my slice of bread, not on my jumper, right? So if you see a stain of honey on my jumper, you know that something that shouldn't have been there landed there. So it fell across and between categories, right? You don't put honey on clothes, you put honey on bread. And that's what made it from one moment being perfectly clean and lovely to eat to something being dirty that you need to take your jumper off and put it in the washing machine to clean it. So this anomalous position of something with respect to an underlying code or structure uh, is what explains pollution and dirt for Mary Douglas. Just to close this clip, I just wanted to draw your attention to something that I said earlier and, I'm, and I've used in a slightly kind of uh, evocative, I hope, way my earlier diagram from the earlier clip, that uh, there's a movement in Levi-Strauss's own thinking, but also historically from Levi-Strauss uh, to his inheritors um, in anthropology, um, from structuralism to what's been called post-structuralism, and roughly post-structuralism is structuralism without the reference to a kind of level of reality which might be the brain or it might be cognitive structures um, uh, that are distributed in the world uh, or uh, any other level of reality that is used as a baseline to explain the surface phenomena that are, that are being explained by the structuralist analyst. Doing away with that idea of a baseline and actually uh, just uh, making a virtue of this idea that codes beget other codes, transform each other, recode, uh, uh, one code can interfere with another and to form an experimental new possibility and so on. That kind of more unhinged, if you like, version of structuralism, one that revels in the possibilities of signs uh, to generate effects of all sorts of kinds, uh, is what we associate with post-structuralism. This is also uh, intimately connected with postmodernism, a uh, kind of unhinged philosophical position in the best sense of that wor word that uh, seeks to be playful and to give up and to be critical of the project of uh, enlightenment science uh, and to see science itself as a, a system of signs it does not ultimately refer to some truth out there that is objectively attainable, but uh, is actually constructed through the play of different forms of signification. All of these ways of thinking, uh, social and cultural constructivism, postmodernism, poststructuralism, they all stem from, or at least can be related back to, Levi-Strauss's move from the surface uh, 
uh, of concrete reality to the depth of structural oppositions, concepts, conceptual relations and abstractions and so on. And that's the bit of Levi-Strauss that I said that I find myself uh, most exciting. And I think I now know which button to press, so I will say what I've been planning to say for each of the clips so far. I think I'll leave it here. And I'll see you in the next clip where we'll see some criticisms of Levi-Strauss.